Amen. Amen. So this summer we've been looking through the Psalms. I would encourage you to open to Psalm 98. Psalm 98 is where we'll be looking this morning. And as we have looked at the Psalms, last week Psalm 67, the week before Psalm 51, oftentimes so many of the Psalms have a connection to the corporate life of Old Testament Israel because they were part of the corporate worship in Old Testament Israel. And so through those connections, we can perhaps better learn or better understand exactly what God's word, as we have it recorded for us, that we can understand and learn from. And so this morning, we'll be looking at Psalm 98, and it is one of the worship songs that exalts God specifically, and the psalmist calls for us to sing a new song. And so we will look at that. If you're using the Bible in the chair pocket in front of you there, Psalm 98 is on page 592. So I would ask that you open there. But in this call of God to his people to praise him, we must understand that to praise God, we must do it according to who he is and what he has done. And as we, as the title might be for this sermon, we in our hearts need to constantly be able to do away with the old and usher in the new because God is always doing something even if we don't recognize it. The Bible tells us his mercies are new every morning. So oh that our hearts would maintain a newness and a freshness in our praise and in our relationship with God. And God not only is always doing something but here we can read what God has done, and the call to God's people in response to what God has done. So you follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read Psalm 98. O sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the king, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And so as we see this morning, this first stanza, and this is one of those elements of poetry in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, that's easily and uh, can be seen in the three specific stanzas that are seen in this song. And distinguished in this new song are the elements that are revealed in verses 1 through 3. Why sing a new song? Because we celebrate what God has done. And look, if you would, as you look at your text, verse 1 includes for us a portrayal of who God is and what God has done. Verse 1 mentions the marvelous things that he has done. It mentions the fact that he has worked salvation. Verse 2 says he's made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness. In verse 3, God is remembered because of his steadfast love and his faithfulness. So we see God's plan has always been in regards to salvation for his people, but it's due to his steadfast love and his faithfulness. What greater reason could there be to rejoice than to sing of the mercies of the Lord because God is steadfast, his love is steadfast, his faithfulness is never ending. And so this fact of who God is and what God has done should be included in the rejoicing of our recall and then our expression of praise and thanks to God because of his love and faithfulness. And if that's not enough, 
let me encourage you to understand, as the psalmist points out, this is all God. This is his love. This is his faithfulness. This is his salvation. This is his goodness to his people. And if you haven't realized yet why that's so important, it's because none of it is contingent upon you. Now, you missed it because you should have shouted amen that none of God's goodness depends on you. Do you catch that? Do you know how inconsistent we are as human beings? Do you know how fickle we are as human beings? Do you know how quickly a word or a circumstance can change the way we feel? That's not God. And so our rejoicing in realizing that all that God has done is because God has done all of that because of who God is. And I rejoice so greatly that it doesn't depend on me. Now, don't point any fingers or don't elbow your spouse, but we can easily be unlovable. I'm glad there's a few of you that recognize that. The rest of you either need to wake up or start paying attention, one or the other. You can be unlovable. Let me just be that blunt. But that doesn't change God's steadfast love and faithfulness towards you, towards his people. And there, in and of itself, is an eternal reason to rejoice. That it's God's love. It's God's faithfulness. It's God's steadfastness. And it makes it clear that it is God's righteousness. It's what God has done in his marvelous ways that he's made known his salvation. And it's interesting that while we may think, well... Maybe there's a little bit of me that thinks God should be glad that I'm on his team. Oh my goodness. So many commentary, uh, there's a number of commentators that connect this psalm with the Exodus and specifically in Exodus chapter 15. And so I want us to see that correlation to help us understand why we should be rejoicing just because of who God is and just because of what God has done. And so when we think about the Exodus, if you don't know your Old Testament history, we'll quickly walk through pieces of it. But they tie Psalm 98 to what's known as the Song of Moses. And the Song of Moses was after the Israelites had come through dry ground on the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army that was in pursuit of them had been judged, the Bible says, or destroyed, or wiped out as that ultimate deliverance from bondage. And in Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 30, the Bible says to us, Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider has been thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. They had reason to sing because they had just witnessed what God had done in delivering them. And so if today, if there's any struggle, if there's any circumstance, if there's any emotional challenge, if there's any weight or burden on you, go back to the cross of Christ and remember that moment where by faith you were eternally delivered through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that faith experience that you had brought you to that place where there was the ultimate realization, the ultimate deliverance from bondage, that I am saved. What do you think those Israelites felt like when they, as the water was coming back together, looked back and saw the destruction of that Egyptian army that was out to only destroy them? Do you think they kind of went, hmm, not bad? 
No, it's recorded right here that they sang in triumph. God saved Israel. Israel saw God's great power. And then they sang, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Oh, that we would re revisit that truth in what Christ has done on the cross on a daily, if not moment by moment basis. There's our reason to sing. Is stuff going to be tough when you go back to work tomorrow? Probably. Is the rest of this day even going to work out according to the way you might have planned? Maybe not. But none of that changes who God is and what God has done. So even in the midst of literally the enemy on your heels, God is your strength. God is your salvation. And as this text tells us from Exodus and can so easily be connected to Psalm 98, they sang a new song because God had done marvelous things. And just as they literally witnessed that physical miracle of deliverance, so too we need to continually and constantly remind ourselves of the great deliverance of Jesus Christ by his blood that was shed on the cross. And so, as Psalm 98 1 tells us, to sing that new song because God has done marvelous things. And it also brings this application of praise home to God's people, not only then, but for us now, for us today. See, here's the problem we all have an old song, we all have a hit list, we all have a playlist. We all have something that's our default falling back into. Now, I'm not going to say anything about you specifically, well, at least not yet. But here's the old hit list, the old pop list, the old song of songs for the Israelites. And if you know your Old Testament history, this is nothing new to you. But you can look in Exodus chapter 14 through 17 even after they saw this incredible deliverance of God, why the admonition to sing a new song? Because they, like us, keep reverting back to our default old song. And you know what their old song was? Their old song was grumbling. Don't raise your hand, but boy, as human beings, we're good at grumbling. Their old song was grumbling. You know, even as they despaired when they had reached the Red Sea, having seen the ten plagues, having seen and experienced the Passover and the deliverance of God, they get to the Red Sea, and all of a sudden they're despairing. And as Pharaoh's army was drawing in on them, they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you've brought us out here to die in the wilderness? They were complainers. They were grumblers. They lived in despair. And again, they had just seen the plagues that delivered them. They had just experienced the Passover that saved the firstborn from the judgment of the death angel. I mean, they had already seen God do incredible things. And yet they still grumbled and despaired and complained. Now I'm going to get personal. Stop it. Stop your grumbling. Stop your complaining. Stop your despair. This is the God who not only delivered the Israelites from Egypt, but this is the God who gave his own son for you. And the scripture asked the rhetorical question, what else is there to do? And yet we still complain. God, I don't like the way things are going. God, have you forsaken me? God, why did you bring me on this route? God, why have you allowed this to happen? Have I hit any notes yet? That old song coming back to your mind? Repent and ask God to forgive you and to wipe that old song away. That's why the psalmist said, you need to sing a new song. You need to sing a new song. Don't, 
Don't hang in with the old. Has it, has it ever frustrated you that maybe in your attempt to live for Christ, you find it such a struggle to memorize verses from the Bible, but a song from your junior high or high school days, you can quote every word? The problem is we still do that spiritually. And the reason it was a problem for the Egyptians was because even after God, through the plagues, through the Passover, through the Red Sea, they weren't done with the old song list. God, where's water? God had to bring it out of a rock. God, where's food? God sent them. You know, they even complained about that. Their old song kept coming up over and over and over again. You need to ask God and the power of his Holy Spirit to deliver you from that old song of the flesh that keeps diverting your heart and your mind away from the call to sing the new song of God. And that song should be new every morning because every morning that he allows you to take a breath we sang it earlier. Do you know even the lungs that he created and the way the air works in and out of the lungs, we praise him, that's still all his. That still all belongs to him. See what I mean by sing a new song. Stop your complaining. Stop your grumbling. Stop going back to that old song list. But it sure does seem attractive, doesn't it? Why? Because just like the Egyptians, or excuse me, just like the Israelites as they were going through the wilderness, they knew they were going to have something to eat if they were in Egypt. And the problem is they were willing to sacrifice their commitment to God for the convenience of comfort today. And if there's a sin in the Christian church in this century, in our country. It's the sacrifice of convenience for comfort instead of a commitment to God Almighty. I dare you to show me different. Even in our Christian churches, we've become all about comfort. You know, in my whole life of ministry, I've actually had people on a regular basis, KT, say to me, um, well, you know, this pew is a little uncomfortable. This, this chair just doesn't fit quite right. God forgive us that we keep going to the old song list because we're not singing that new song in Christ. Our life isn't portraying the melody of godliness in our heart. And that doesn't have anything to do with being a musician. I hope you understand that. It's the song of our heart. And so I trust that as the second stanza tells us in Psalm 98, that we will always make a joyful noise. You know, that's been the joke. I can't sing, but I can make a joyful noise. It, even if you can sing, that doesn't mean you're praising God. Do you understand that? You could have the prettiest voice in the world. That doesn't mean you're praising God. It's the melody of God in our heart that's portrayed through our life. And then, yes, through our praise. And then, yes, I am grateful that we have musicians who rehearse and use the skills that God has given them. Yes, that is certainly helpful when we gather together. But when you're out by yourself, let it rip. Because praise and worship comes from the heart. And that's how we're to be making a joyful noise. Look at what verses 4 through 6 tell us. Look again at your text. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Let me say that again. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Break forth into joyous song and sing Praises. Are you catching this? <laughs> Sing praises again is emphasized. 
with the lyre, with the sound of the melody. The lyre's not your spouse. That was an ancient musical instrument. Okay. Make melody. It was a stringed instrument, like we would say the harp or the guitar or the piano today. It was an instrument that was used melodiously to help in worship. But long before the psalmist says that, we're still told to just shout and sing praise to make a joyful noise. Look at verse 6, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise. The implication here is a loud, powerful praise. And I know, I know, I know all you old songers. I hear it every time I preach a sermon like this. Well, you know, it's just not my personality to the... God saved you to change your personality. God saved you so that the melody he's placed in your heart will be expressed. Yes, your Christianity is as personal as anything else in your life, but it was never intended to be private. I mean, can you read those verses? Sing praises with the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of a horn, make a joyful noise. Is there anything in those phrases that implies quiet to you? I'm glad three of you have caught on. No. That's why the joyful noise. God wants what he's done inside of you to be expressed outside of you. Hallelujah. Amen. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. You know, I've actually had people, and this is where we at FSBC need to be set free. I've actually had people in recent weeks, you know, you're teaching on the Psalms and praise, and do, do, do you think somebody would be bothered if I shouted out or if I, I said no? And if they are, just tell them to read the Bible. You know, the Bible tells us to clap. The Bible tells us to raise our hands. The Bible tells us to shout. The Bible tells us to make a joyful note. I, I, but so many of us are so, con what will others think? Let me tell you, if your praise in any way brings concern about what others think, you're already off track. Your praise is only to be directed to the one true God. And let me tell you something, if somebody's bothered by that, it's kind of like I've had to tell them with the word of God, Pastor, I didn't like what you said today. I said, you know, I didn't write it. I didn't write it. It's that same way with praise. We're to make a joyful noise. And the scripture is clear. And oh, by the way, we read other scriptures before the songs that we sang are scripturally based. And this isn't the only place where the Bible says it. <laughs> okay? Well, make sure you understand that. Noise, trumpets, breaking forth. I propose that the praise of God should be so glorious and should, should be so obvious. Because here's my concern as your pastor. If it's not happening amongst a group of people, of all of us who believe that's the way it should be, I can almost guarantee you your life's not doing it outside of this building. Because right. anything you would have trouble doing amongst others who are doing the same thing, it's highly unlikely that you're going to be doing it when you're out by yourself. We as humans just don't work that way. So practice and then as you go out through the week, continue to proclaim that praise. And then look in the final stanza. And this may be just as exciting as the call of nature in praise to God is revealed. All creation is to praise God. Look at verse 7. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together. Now, as we mentioned earlier, if this is connected to the Exodus, 
that the Israelites experienced. I got to tell you, thinking back, what, would, what was the roar like when God was holding up the Red Sea and then when God released it? I, I mean, you know, water doesn't move without making noise. And especially not that much water being held up and then being released. I got to tell you, there had to have been a roar when that sea, in obedience to the Almighty God who created it, and in that roar, it was proclaiming the very salvation that God had promised his people. I guarantee you it wasn't silent. Guarantee you it wasn't silent. And then look at verse 8. Let the rivers clap their hands. Fast forward 40 years as the Israelites were crossing the Jordan River again on dry ground to begin their entry into the promised land. You know that water had to be lapping up against whatever was holding it back. And I can just hear that lapping being just like clapping. Now, I'm not going to die over a theological connection there, but I think the imagery of the poetry certainly gives us a clear picture of how God, as the creator, and that in God's creation is not void of his praise. We looked at it a number of weeks ago in Psalm 19. It tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. And so the God of creation being praised by his creation certainly isn't anything that we wouldn't understand in revealing his glory. But as I studied this text, it was impossible to avoid the connection to the New Testament, especially in Romans chapter 8. And this is one of those New Testament passages that reveals God's ultimate consummation in his self when all is said and done. And in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22, just listen. It says, for the creation, catch this, talking about the creation. The creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to con corruption. Remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, all of creation was tainted. Okay? And I believe the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is revealing here, even creation is longing to explode back to what it was originally intended to do. And that is, as the psalm says, declare God's glory, to give God praise. But let me continue reading that the creation is moaning to be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. What an explosion, what an awesome encounter it's going to be upon the return of Christ. But the new song as God's people is a song that we can be singing and celebrating now because we know the faithfulness of God fulfilled in his son, Jesus Christ. Even in the midst of our failures, we can sing a song of hope to the eternal glory and praise of God as his children, as part of his creation. And that's not all, folks. The Apostle John got a glimpse into eternity. And you can read it multiple times throughout the book of Revelation. And all of those glimpses into eternity, Revelation 4, Revelation 5, Revelation 19, they all include praise. They all include praise. And in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, the Holy Spirit inspired John to write this. And they sang a new song. You know who they is? That's everyone who's around the throne. 
to everyone who's around the throne. He writes, they sang a new song saying, worthy are you, they're singing to Christ, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Well, if you can't praise God now, you're going to be miserable in heaven. I've just given you a heads up. Just a warning. But let me tell you, that's what's correct. If you can't praise now, it's God needing to work in and through you. It's not a God problem. Okay? And may we ever sing the new song of God. Joining those saints who are singing around the throne in eternity. Because the lamb was worthy to be slain and by his blood redeem for God people from every tribe and every tongue and every language and every nation. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. May that ever be our song. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Holy God,